No, oh, he's a he's a la- he's no he's a he's a lazy racist, and everything that he needs to know about hegemony, he's already doing. Yeah, yeah. He's already got his fingers in the in the pie. He's at just some point, throwing throwing food around. At some point, you're rich enough to not have to wor- learn how to spell the word hegemony. Look, yeah, we can't put too fine a point on it. The guy is insane. He's somebody who's not in control of his mental faculties. That's yeah. this whole story. Yeah. That's it. What more do you need to know? You know, crazy is as crazy does. What, one thing that you know about crazy people is no one wants to be around him or them unless they're crazy. <laughs> Which brings us to this little crazy movie. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Le Grand Booth. The Big Feast. With myself, Cole Smithy, and my co-host, Mike Lacey. As we love to do, we are here to copiously consume international politics and culture through the prism of a single film and a different craft beer each week. Cole, I, uh, I don't have a lot of money, and I'm a struggling creative, and so I... You know, I just scraped together a couple of pence, and I uh, and I got a I, I got us some shite beer. A couple of quid. A couple. Of, yeah. Well, I, some quid. I could have got some decent. Could have got some nice cider. Ah, uh, so you have brought us the finest Stella Artois from thirteen sixty six of Belgium Brewing. So something. A little known fact. Expertise. This, this this beer is it's you know this is a lesson in marketing. It's 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 somewhat respect. If you bring Stella to a party of your your average folk, they'll be you know oh cool Stella I love Stella. Um, if you talk to a British person, they're like that's the shittiest beer in the world. Which uh, my my coworker uh, uh, David. Uh, that's it, the Paps Blue ri- Ribbon of, it really of is. England. Yeah, maybe the Bud even. Um, but it's there's something yeah, more. Rhythm there's is, something is more American. Bud. There's something more American about those beers. Like this is a known to be. Um, so here's the backstory I heard on it is that during the Thatcher days when things were really tough, yeah. people couldn't afford domestic beer, but the imported beer, hmm. unlike how we think about it, imported beer, was actually cheaper and shittier, and it was kind of like Budweiser there. So Stella got big, and then with that boost, wanted to brand itself as an American beer. And in America, we interpret imported beers as having a lot of legitimacy. Yeah. And so they really beefed it up into this high-class thing. And so let's just take a sip. Let's be honest. Maybe it's great. I don't know. Let's, All right. We're going to drink some Stella Artois. Let's drink some Stella Artois. It's not as bad as a Budweiser. No, but it does have a similar palate. It's not good, and it's yeah. not a craft beer. So we're really breaking with tradition once again at at Mike's behest. Mike, with, at Mike's <laughs> assistance. Well, first of all, Mike is always doing it in a very interesting meta way that increases the conceit of this podcast to a next conceptual level. Also, Mike needs to find a craft beer place between his office and this podcast studio. Mm, that's the real. That's the real thing. Maybe we need to leave work earlier and head down to. Um, what word do you recommend? I, I know you have uh, differing opinions about on uh, Second Avenue. You have. Um, What's it called? What's a second in C- like a 85th or 4th? City or? Swiggers City is on Swiggers. A, That's on 82nd. It's on 82nd. Sorry, 86th, 86th between 2nd and 3rd. Yeah. I think. Where else are you hitting between up Between 1st and 2nd. You've been going to any, um, besides the Blind Tiger, which I hear is, uh, have been to, and it is one of the greatest Yeah, but you know, everything, my, one of my grocery stores, you don't know this, Pioneer, where I used to get beers. At 92nd in Lexington, it's a whole grocery store. Uh-huh. It's been there ever since I moved in the neighborhood in 97. They they couldn't pay their rent. They went They're under. Out. No way. Yeah, it was crazy how it happened. The electricity got pulled, and you knew, you know, a grocery store can't really go with that electricity for more than a day or so. And yeah. after about five or six days, yeah, okay, all done. And they moved everything out. I'm really hoping that they open a Trader Joe's at 92nd in Lexington. If the powers that be are listening, please consider putting a Trader Joe's into the location currently on You're, the... You've really sold out, Cole. You're asking for a Trader on Joe's? On the northeast corner of 92nd in Lexington, right across the street from the 92nd Street Y. Yeah, I I imagine a Trader Joe's three blocks from an H&M is uh, hashtag doable. <laughs> like, that's, that, I think you'll get your wish. Well, let's get down to with nail and I. There's, I, I suspect that this is going to be one of our more popular podcasts because this movie, Bruce Robinson's With Nail and I, 
it has a, following. A, a very big cult following for good reason, many good reasons. To, to cite my expert on all things British, my my coworker David, uh, again, um, this film it, it wasn't a huge splash in theaters, I understand, but in the VHS rewatch market, definitely grew uh, across the pond. I'll admit I never heard of it, and it, it, I don't think it has a lot of clout here, but. Eminently quotable is what Eminently I heard. Eminently quotable. And also, it spawned a lot of people doing a similar thing of getting up, going to the country for a while. It, it, it seems like people took vacations based on it, which nothing comes to mind immediately, but there are definitely films that have spawned, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe people go on some fear and loathing type trips in this country based on other cult favorites like that, but it seems a bit unique in the canon of cult movies. So it, so we have the, it's based on Bruce Robinson's experiences uh, when he was living in Camden town and as a young impoverished artist, wannabe artist living with a bunch of other people who were art also artsily inclined, but he was the filmmaker of the bunch. And so he made short films that he, they lived in this great uh, flat that there were, it was the whole house. It was the, it was owned by one of the guys. He, he had inherited this house. And so there were 16 people just squeezed into different rooms in this place and they all lived there. And so this is an autobiographical story. And I think you really get that in the movie mm. out of these sequences that these are people based on real people. And I don't know about the situations. I think this it's a little, it gets a little farcical. It gets very farcical. Right. And I love that about the, the movie that even as, as episodic as all of their adventures seem to be, there is a, 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 a bigger picture having to do with sexuality, male sexuality at the heart of it. And that I found really interesting the way it's handled in this movie, because I think, I also think that's something that isn't talked about, in the way that I perceived the movie anyway, because there's yeah, a, this is the most, this is very subtextually homoerotic to the point of being like just text text. Exactly. And, um, exactly. Um, I brought up uh, fear and loathing earlier and I think that there is a gonzo element to this. It's very Hunter S Thompson. Um, well, with Neil is certainly a, that kind of extreme character where he, he's he's drinking lighter fluid uh, in like scene the number three. The drinking of the lighter fluid just kills me every time I see it. It's so out of control. Don't drink that. I drank it. Do you have more? <laughs> it's, 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 something like that. it's the kind of thing where it's like I don't dare try to quote from memory because I'm sure people have it way better than me. But uh, so 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 Richard E. Grant plays with with Neil, and he's he's this over the top. Shakespearean thespian. He's kind of a fop. He's very much a thespian. And he has his, his friend, uh, I, who's... Yeah, who's, who's, apparently he, there's a name, so this is a little inside baseball, right? There's a name of the character that if you look up... And, Marwood. Marwood, it doesn't appear, like it's not stated in the movie, but I think it's he in calls the him. No, I think he calls think, him Marwood in the movie a couple I, times. I, 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 I thought it was, um, in, in the credits... I believe he's credited as ellipses, 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 and I. Really? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of a Fight Club thing going on here to talk about another cult movie that comes to mind in a little bit is um, our main character in that film, also the narrator. Oh, you are right. Paul McGann's character is, is named And I. It's a little bit like but Ed but Norton's he, character doesn't have a name either. Yeah, but Marwood is his name. And, yeah, and if the, you listen for it, I'm like pretty, pretty sure you'll, you'll hear it. And then, then, of course, there's Richard Griffith's Uncle Monty, and we'll get to Uncle the Monty. The perpetual uncle. There's a certain body shape that you take on, and you will have roles, but you will be an obese problematic uncle be you a closeted homosexual or just a muggle you're no, but he's he's very openly gay but i, I just want to set set it's the thing up so these two guys live in live in canada in this in in just utter what's, squalid what's, where's camden uh i'll look it up it's, as we it's go where on. the orioles play right Anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's where that's where they lived, and this is and it's the late '60s. So, th so there's this generational thing that's going to happen in the UK, which is a corollary to what happened with the end of the '60s, where 
the Charles Manson murders ended the 60s for America, mm-hmm. there's a similar cataclysm, generational cataclysm that is occurring to these two people, but it's happening in a very personal way. All right. And when you hear Marwood tell Uncle Monty that he and Withnail haven't spent a night apart for the past six years, that factoid is believable. I think that that's, that's the nature of, of, of this relationship between with nail and Marwood, which is what the whole story is about because with nail, he's, he's an, he's an actor who's never going to make it. Right. He is one of these guys who's, he, he, he's all pent up frustration and it will, he will always, he will never fail to take, to, to snatch the egg of victory from, from the mouth of, destruction and, and throw it into the volcano right. self-sabotaging to the always degree, always right. and he's a complete alcoholic if not i was i was certain that these guys were heroin addicts in the first scene but that never really came to no they to the just floor. smoke They're, and drink a lot just, and, and 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 they'll take crazy pills they had a, a drug dealer who was basically th- challenging with nail to, oh, yeah. to, to to throw down oh, on God. just like you know, we gotta you get take to that this pill and you'll be on and he's right, like here's here's I the could take that and run a marathon here's the kicker though richard e grant didn't drink at all. Oh, he man. didn't drink and he's playing the most impressive drunk. So convincing. That's great. Cause I've seen people do poor. I was in a production of 12th night and Sir Toby who's oh. a very notorious drunk had never had a drink in their life. And they were not very believable. Convincing. Yeah. Mm. College theater. I tell but you. During, but during the, I don't know if it was during the shooting or during the rehearsal period, they, they got it. They got Richard Grant really drunk. Oh yeah, yeah. The direct, yeah <laughs> we Bruce, talked Bruce, about Bruce doing Robinson, that with Sir Toby. Too. Bruce Robinson <laughs> we didn't pull it off. Got we him. Should've. Got him really drunk to, so that he would have that experience to 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 draw from, and it works. I mean, it just works great. There's a couple of scenes. I love the scene when they get busted uh, because he's been driving like a complete folio. And <laughs> fully, yeah. let's he's bring so, that back. He's so let's invent drunk. that and then bring it back. <laughs> I think folio has been around for a while. I mean, that's the thing is these guys are folios. They really, <laughs> they, they really are just a couple of clowns. You're not happy that they came into the, the bar where, you, where you're eating or the restaurant where you're eating because they've they've got chips on their shoulders a, a mile high, but they come up with this scheme. Even though I don't think either one has met Uncle Uncle Monty before, oh, haven't they? They talk, there's a thing in the beginning where they're sitting in the diner trying to trying to concoct the plan, and somehow Withnail calls up his his uncle, his rich uncle, his rich uncle who has a place in the in the Lake District, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is very wet this time of year. Maybe it's wet all the time, but everything in this movie is wet and muddy. I asked David where the Lake District is, uh-huh. and he told me, and I don't remember. Maybe it's north of Birmingham? Maybe not. Ah, oh, man, we have a lot of British listeners who are just really yeah, upset. Yeah, right they, I just hope they, they... I just want them to know what an American perspective watching this movie is. Is And I, here's, here's the thing, is like, I'm going to go ahead and say, like, I don't really get it. You know, well, here, well, I, I, I let me let me just put it's like it's like this seems I think fun. You do this get seems it. cool. You I don't do know. Get it. You it's do like, get it. It's all about this bromance between these two guys. That's a, I, that's I, universal. I, 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 rec- that. I recently watched an American Werewolf in London, which was playing at the Campus Drive In when I got my job there in 1981. In the fall of 1981, the place was a block. I had to drive. Can you imagine, Mike? I, I, I move into my apartment in San Diego, and I've got a Tower Records and a cinema, a stone's throw this way, and one block in the other direction. I'm never moving. I've got, I've got a drive-in cinema where, hello, I have a job, and... American Werewolf in London was playing for a long time. So I saw that movie so many times, but it reminds me the relationship to the, the, the bromance that, that gets ripped apart in that movie early on. Mm-hmm. We, we get to see a very similar brand of that happening in this movie. And 
it, it has to be talked about how Paul McGann's character takes on a very feminine appearance through much of the movie. We're, we're looking at the movie right now, and they've just gotten to the chalet, shall we call it, and there's no heat. There's no electricity. Hovel. It's a hovel. But it's, it's, it's a, there's no, some nice rugs. The bedrooms look pretty cozy. It's a Vaclav hovel. But, it, but it, yeah, it's dirty. In the, on the, main, the main room is dirty, and there's no electricity. There's no heat. There's no nothing. And I, I think it's kind of summed up by their, the, the distance that they have from this true way of living, where they're staring at this chicken, and they know they're going <laughs> to eat it that night. <laughs> And there just seems to be... They don't know how to kill it. They've they, they've never killed a, a farm animal just before. just such a gulf between that chicken being alive on their table and them eating it. And it's basically a smash cut to them sticking it into a teapot. Yeah, I mean, like, like I get it. I get this movie, but there, it's... it's it's so British. It's so British. It's very British. And, it's, I, and, that, that, and I feel so distant from... This is... I'm going to be really embarrassed to say this. I'm so distant from what what England in the 80s or 60s was like that I didn't realize this was a period piece. I I knew it was from the 80s, and I thought it was about the 80s. Well, it's about like, more than that. You know, you look at Richard E. Grant's character, and he's such a vampire. The guy right. is just this... He's very th- like he's he's very believable as a guy who would drink lighter fluid to get drunk. Like, he's, yeah, he's yeah. he's a force of nature. He's like Klaus Kinski, this guy. His Richard E. Grant's performance is just a thing of beauty. It's so fierce. He's yeah. just bringing it. And the Paul McGann character, who's best pal, who they've lived together forever, he has a feminine nature. And there are, after Uncle Monty shows up, who really is the life of the party and brings a, a very civilized experience to their life, albeit for a short number of hours, he has only the 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 best homosexual intentions shall we say so are they queer what what like is, i i guess, suppose not what 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 is the, the point trying to make there's so okay, many well, romance right, right, so, movies well, now well, and... okay so well but to, for me this movie is re, is really comes down to i it comes down to marwood paul mcgann's character because what he doesn't know is that Withnail has already uh, greased the rails, shall we say, in Monty's mind that he, Marwood, is a closet homosexual and looking for any excuse to uh, m- move on to the next level in his life. And so s- suddenly in the movie, we start seeing. Marwood and his hair is curly. He's got curls and his face, it looks like he's wearing a little bit of lipstick. And he talks about not being able to stop smiling when he, when with Neil gets him alone and he says, I can't help it. That's whenever I look at Monty, that's what I do. So he's having, Monty is having this effect on Marwood and the, the, Wait, the, the trans, yeah. the transition, I, I think the whole overriding theme of this movie has to do with this with Marwood's decision to either experiment with homosexuality or not and you that's the tension for the most of the second act that's the tension i mean it's kind of like a more it's like um Brideshead revisited uh, on like a, a a bunch of of um, mescaline or something. You well, know, it rides on it rides on 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 on, on Uncle Monty. He's this mentor. For both of them, because he can recite verse. But are he, they, he was an I'm actor. Sorry, I, I He's very cultured. Are, are they queer or like? Who? I mean, like I guess it's 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 cool if it's not if it's not clear. But it's like I'm trying to get to the the center conceit. And is it about how difficult it is to sustain a, a male best friendship, or is there actually? No, it's uh, not about that. No, it, it it is about this. It's about Marwood. Look at mm-hmm. his hair. It's about Marwood coming to terms with his feminine self under the, under the tutelage of Monty, who's this very cultured, well-humored, well humored, humored guy. Well, 
who uh, is really an ideal gatekeeper, if you will, for uh, for Marwood. But Marwood can't. He can't. He can't handle him. He can't handle that part of himself. He's not. More, he's not ready. He's not ready ex- for be it. Be more explicit. Do you, th- you think it's saying that 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 Marwood is gay and that Marwood? I think is a is a closeted homosexual, but he cannot come to terms with it. And at the end of the film, w- once he gets his acting role, he he becomes an entirely different person. Uh, you recall at the end yeah. at the end of the movie, his hair is very short. And he doesn't look the same at all. He looked. He turns into the, into um, you know the the next character that he's going to play. I suspect. But doesn't that speak to the idea that maybe this isn't about his authentic well, sexuality? I, no, I think it's about he's, he's, he's malleable. It's about a lot he's of things. It, yeah, it's about a lot of things. About the fact that he is malleable and he is an actor. And so you know, the best actors are the ones who are just vessels. They're you know they're the most boring people to talk to. Right. Robert right, right. De Niro is the worst person to interview. View. That's why for me, filmmakers are much more. I'd rather right. I'd much rather sit down and talk to a director than an actor because actors are just worried about where their ne- their next roles I mean, coming that from. That brings up an interesting thing: is, is we we talk about actors being like you said, empty vessels, or they're they're incredibly malleable. Their personality is based on what they need to be in the moment. Do you think it's possible that you could be so fluid that you don't have any sort of orientation, even a a fluid orientation. You just are whatever the situation tells you to be. Like, well, like you, that's a very cynical I, well, reading, I which I don't think this movie's not, being that You know, I listened about. to an interview about Lou Reed. There's a, a a new Lou Reed biography out there, and he's a guy who uh, had a, a transsexual girlfriend for a while, for three years, and you know they lived together, Rachel, the whole bit. Um, and you think about. You know, Lou Reed, David Bowie, both bisexual, Iggy Pop, bisexual, Robert Downey Jr., bisexual. Oh, all, I didn't know that. That's he, exciting to me for some reason. Yeah, Robert Downey Jr., you know, ask anyone who lived in the village or, sorry, in in, um, in Chelsea in the early 80s. And Robert Downey Jr. would walk down the street in these hot yellow shorts and T-shirt head bandana the whole bit love it just sashaying around love it yeah um he is in milk isn't he am i am i wrong that he's in the film um the the gus van sant film uh milk and uh he's uh cole's looking it up i think it's right but um it's it seemed like he had a uh, an affinity to be in that. I may be way off base, but I, I think he's in that movie. Anyway, um, you 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 were talking about actors and um, the sort of uh, sexual orientation fluidity there, and in, in Lou Reed, and you know, I, I was kind of going this direction and saying, is it about? Um, is is this betraying this sort of cynicism because we see him put on this new role at the end where he's totally changed and the situation doesn't require it? But I don't I don't think it's making anything like sort of darkly cynical like that. Well, I, you know the the movie for me the movie really gets interesting when Uncle Monty shows up because now you have somebody who's bringing life into the movie or the movie becomes this comic fiesta when he There's shows a bit of a up. lack of oxygen when it's just the two of them like their their relationship seems exhausting yeah it really is but then as soon as monty comes into the picture it's it's vibrant and stuff is happening and there's lots of food around and 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 there's Ideas are being expressed. You well, know, it, feel, it feels like the conversation ha- has been elevated. But what what Marwood doesn't know is that Whitney has gone behind his back and told Uncle Monty that Marwood is really a closeted homosexual. It supposedly he did, he did this as a as a you know just because he didn't care it was just a goof. But I think it is telling that he did that because. You know, there, you know, you think about it. There has to be some kind of motive behind that, and perhaps the motive is that Marwood will have a sexual experience with Uncle Monty, and then with Neil will be able to have, uh, as a result, with Neil will be able to have sex with Marwood. Right, because that's that's the other part of it is that with Neil also seems 
he's the more obviously gay character. Right. Right. And so he's trying to uh, indoctrinate him a bit. So on top, on top of all of this uh, kind of queer sexual politics, what Uncle Monty is, is he's also a grown up. He's he's so, he is yeah these are the kids and he and he's the adult in 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 that he's he's showing that you can um how do I put this uh have clean clothes and nice things and be a human being you sure know? these guys are yeah. li- these guys are living real garbagely you know they are but we get they're acting like cavemen who have to discover everything for but themselves we, we get we learn so much through all of that because then they have marwood has to tell this this lie in order to get my uncle monty off of him there's also some 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 sexual overtures that some people would probably in this day and age ha- have a hard time with that of Uncle Monty, because he's very forward yeah. about, but also, he, but also kids? he also he backs off when he when he get when he has sent the signal that it's that his overtures are are not desired. He he backs off. My guess is that uh, Uncle Monty is probably pushing fifty five sixty, and these guys are in their late twenties. Yeah, maybe mid twenties. Maybe, maybe mid twenties. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The big thing through it, right, is this sexual politics. But one thing that's universally relatable is that these are guys who move into the metropolitan area and they're at a cusp of society changing. Their their parents are not not mentioned, and you assume that their opinion is that they don't know shit and they're gonna like discover themselves discover themselves creatively. And it's that kind of thing that happens in every metropolitan thing where these kids are. They're going to invent everything for themselves. You're going to just like have to learn all of your lessons. I love I love the line when Uncle Monty says something about you know if need be I'll commit an act of burglary. And <laughs> do you think he means buggery? Yes. Yeah. And there's a great scene where <laughs> where Marwood is bent over the couch. <laughs> <laughs> and Uncle Monty comes in from behind, but Marwood doesn't move. He stays in the same position. And there's the, the the seduction scene between them. Marwood just looks so feminine. But how convinced are you that 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 Marwood is actually closeted and not just a sensitive guy who has a best friend and is a, a little bit attached? And then well, suddenly there's a very imposing. Uh, the, it's very imposing. I, I think that, I think that, that Bru- Bruce him. Robinson worked with this actor to create this feminine uh, visage that we see that, because yeah. because there's there there are scenes where his hair is very curly. He's wearing makeup. He looks very womanly. <laughs> he does look a little bit like Saint Vincent, the uh, the the singer, if you know what that is, um, or a, you know, kind of a he's got that great like kind of King David hair. Um, but Ri- we all think he's hot, Cole. Let's put it out there. He's a handsome guy. Yeah, he's got high cheekbones. But Richard, but um, but Richard Griffiths is just tremendous. He's so great. He's so hilarious. Now let me ask you: Have we watched a British film that? hasn't had a Harry Potter actor in it, which I know is a joke because there's literally none, but I believe everyone that we've watched, I don't know, I think I might just be thinking of two, um, but... Well, what are the British films that we've done on the show? Well, we, we watched a movie with David Thewlis, right? Um, uh, the... Was that actually Australian? Is he Australian? Um, the It's the one where he smears the chocolate all over. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, that's uh... That is British. I can't remember which movie that that is um, off the top of my head. Um, what is the, uh, our, our audience is flipping out on us? But um, it's uh, anyway that one, right? It's the chocolate one. Um, it's just it's, the sweet, the sweet life, the sweet like, life, not is, sweetie, the sweet life. Yeah, the sweetie is the Australian one. Yeah, the sweet yeah, it's life. the it's the Mike Lee film, I believe. Mike Lee, I think it's Mike Lee. Yeah, it's just funny. It's it's a trope now, but you can't watch a British film without seeing it. At least one Harry Potter. Actor. Was it Richard Griffiths? In, in he the... is Harry's uncle. Oh my god, Mr. Dursley. 
And oh my God. I like the thing that they put him in a fat suit because he's about three times bigger than this, and it really seems unsustainable, that body mass. And honestly, not British. It's really an American thing. But I, I do think that British people carry their weight in a different way than Americans. I do too. It's, it's much more kingly. The yeah. way that British people carry their weight, it it looks like they've gotten fat on other people's food. You know what I mean? Like, it, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it, it sounds good. I, I I think when you work a minimum wage and then you eat food from someone who makes minimum you eat, wage, you eat from their trash. It, it it goes to like the lower part of your body. You know, it kind of like weighs you down and you sort of slump. Whatever British food is doing, maybe it's all it's all the goose. You know, you're getting fat on duck okay, goose. Okay, the movie, the Mike Lee film is is Life is Sweet. Life is Sweet. Life is Sweet. So if you get fat on goose, I feel like it doesn't affect your back in the same way. And you just go out in this really impressive way. You know, in this way that you can make it through a doorway straight wise, but if you go sideways, you're you're going to be making someone's living well, room a lot more I, comfortable. I, 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 would, I would propose that we do... We go into a little British movie phase, okay. and I would say if we have any, any little Brit flicks, yeah, if we have a little Brit flight, if there's any listeners that we have in the UK who have, especially uh, from the kitchen sink genre, you have a, a specific movie in mind that you'd like for us to do, please get in touch with us. You can always get uh, in touch with us uh, through colesmithy.com. You'll see how to click the email thing at the top. Uh, and let us know if there's if there's a specific British film that you would like us to discuss. Yeah, get in touch. Um, uh, Cole might not agree with this, but I'm fairly ignorant of of British film, and I I would love if if someone from the UK wanted to wanted to subscribe on Patreon at a level where you want to even be a guest on the show, give us a suggestion. That'd be great. I want your POV. I think we do have a big audience there, and. I'm really interested in the gaps that we have between the pond because especially with these cult films, it tells you so much about a group. This came out in the the kind of mid eighties. And then I think hit the VHS after that. And it really means a lot to a lot of people. And it's funny because we have our own versions of that cult movies say so much more about a generation, I think than the box office. You know, a movie that people discover and watch over and over yeah, and over. Well, and over. Like, yeah, that tells you so much I mean, more. Because no, right? Thor is going to kill it this weekend. There's, there's, that's not but the, no the one's movie going, of a generation. No one's going to see Thor 30 times. Mm-hmm. There's people that have seen this movie 30, 40, 50, 100 times. Right. Hey, this is, a you know, the whole thing with people quoting lines is just insane. There are so many quotable lines. I didn't even say the <laughs> I will commit an act of buggery or burglary, but it is funny how burglary and just infers buggery, buggery. burglary, buggery. <laughs> you know, that's what I would ask your wild went down for was buggery. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a tragic tale there. You know. Yeah, I I I have the I have the Oscar Wilde biography which I read and it's it's you, so depressing. Did you ever see the um? Um, the, the, the movie, um, with, uh, Stephen Fry as Oscar Wilde. Um, it's, it's, it's quite good. And, um, Stephen Fry is definitely his, he's, what's re- it called? I think I've seen it. It might be just be called, it might be called Wild with an exclamation point. I'm not sure, but yeah. Or, or Oscar. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen it. But, um, yeah, it's good. He's got the right physique, but Oscar Wilde was. A lot handsomer than Stephen Fry. He was. He was yes, but he always he had a stunner. pimple on his toilet. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> he had a pimple on his toilet. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they would call like you know you're prepared. You prepared your face. That would uh-huh. call it like with the state of your toilet. My girlfriend's been telling me to wash my face because it's. I think I have. I don't have acne or any. Like I don't. No, I don't. I know I don't have acne. But um, well, maybe like a little bit. No, no. I feel but, like a pig shot on my head. That's how you feel. No, that's with Neil. I feel like a pig. Sh- that's what she's been telling me. She says my having not washed my face enough is causing her skin to break out, and that's just very anxiety producing. Just got to put that out there. That's what I'm thinking. My toilette is not properly. <laughs> no, it has not been properly addressed. Uh. No, it's no, not. Yeah. No. What What is with Neil rubbing all over his body at the beginning of the film? I forgot that. I it looks what like, is it, like baby powder or something. That, I don't know what the like beginning. It's not like sunblock. He's trying to keep warm. He's so got he's it all over his coat. I mean, these, yeah. these people are just, 
when when Uncle Monty's around, around, they're they're dressed and they're groomed, but when he's not around, it's really bad for well, them. You've you've like you've lived rough when you were young. You know this. Sure, rem- this I lived is, in my van from Salinas in Salinas for two semesters. This is kind of how it goes. Is like you have family in town and. Suddenly you're you're not cursing constantly and you've managed to find your toothbrush and then as soon as they're gone you're just you know. So we also have to talk about the Jimi Hendrix. Uh I don't I have no idea how Bruce Robinson Yeah, what was got that? licensed Jimi Hendrix m- music for this movie, but it, Oh, you know how Or he, maybe he didn't. I don't well, know. Well, you know who's the EP on this movie? What do you mean? George Harrison. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, well there you go. There's the yeah, connection. Yeah, he made a, he made a lot of movies. There's um, the connection. And um, the only one I know immediately is uh, the so some of the Monty Python ones, including Life of Brian. Uh-huh. Um, I think I think George Harrison was really heavily involved in the financing of Life of Brian, and he is uh, listed as a producer on this. You got to think that that helped. Either he just bankrolled the soundtrack, and it really makes a difference. the 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 way that that Rob Bruce Robertson uses the the Jimi Hendrix stuff in the movie really makes a mark and really puts them in that late 60s time period and it's just one more layer of narrative meat that that just feels exactly right for these two characters one of whom is doomed and one of whom isn't we presume right and the one who's who's not doomed with nail um Mar- the- marwood sorry the one who is doomed uh-huh. yeah uh with nail with uh-huh. nail's doomed yeah you know he's he's authentic. He's a true artist. He's a true crazy pants thespian over the top. But that's not actually what the world wants, right? The world doesn't want that authentic uh, being that life. You need someone who's malleable. You need someone who can show up at a press. Well, he's junket. a he's a he's a precursor to to the the punks. He's he's one of these people who exist in this existential way that is just is, it's narcissistic as hell, but it's just about his his needs, whatever he wants at that moment. He wants a cigarette. He wants to be warm. He wants something and he's going to have it. And he doesn't care whose expense it comes out. I can't put this in British terms. Yeah. I can put this in American terms. Yeah. He's someone who exists between the beats Uh and punk rock. Uh And that's a crappy time to be like that. You know, he, cause he's really that, that bridges you, 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 you go like the discontent really sort of like, it, but he's it, not. He, but he's not somebody who's who's going to do the work. Is the problem? He's he's yeah. he's just a bum. You know, he's not really going to go for the audition and get the role no. and be there every night performing. I, I love I love it when Uncle Monty gives them forty quid to go get some Wellingtons because they're walking around in plastic bags and yeah. they just take the money and go to the bar. <laughs> they don't even pretend. They're not even going to get one pair to share. They just. When, they, when I hear this is uh, when this is a, a classic beloved cult movie, I feel like it has to do with things like that. I don't think that this. I don't imagine that this is only beloved because of its very interesting uh, queer undertones, or because of its commentary on the the generation gap. I think it's that exact kind of thing. Is like, hey, you know, when your dad is in town and he's like, hey, you should get a nice tie so you can go on job interviews. And you're like, yeah, and then you buy like a fucking thirty well, rack for your you friends. Know, keep in that's, mo- that's keep, it, keep in mind that, that homosexuality was illegal in the UK. And, okay. and so that's you know that's that's the time that we're dealing with here, and there are a lot of transgressive elements in the movie, and I, I noticed that in Wikipedia they categorize this as a black comedy. To me, it's not a black comedy. Uh, it doesn't meet the demands of black comedy. It's a comedy, but there are a lot of social socially real experiences that are put in it with, with the farmer who hates them and the guy, the local who's, who's st- stalking them, maybe wants to kill them. <laughs> yeah. Black comedy seems to me, seems to be, it, it means that there's like, God, like more realism. Well, somebody has to die. With. Some, if it's going to be a black comedy, then somebody has to croak. Uh, I, I did see the George, the George Clooney movie that he, he co-wrote with Grant Hesloff and the, Cohen, the Cohen brothers. 
<laughs> what, which movie is it? Suburbicon. I was just cracking up because the the cop just pulled out uh, with nails fake. Yeah. Pee dispenser with with child well, urine, right? They, 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 yes. they bring it up earlier. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the the famous rule is if you bring up child urine in the first act, you need you, to you, you have to see it. Act. You have to see it spray on the wall in the third. Anyway, the suburbicon, which I really enjoyed. I thought I think it's a really great uh, satire, but people don't uh, people don't appreciate satire anymore. I adore you. Tell him if you must. I no longer care. I mean to have you, even if it must be burglary. That's Uncle Monty's line. I mean to have you, even if it must be burglary. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be hard to watch. Kevin Spacey was never so eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> that was his problem. Well, with, 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 with that topical act of what is, I was going to say, you know, slander but it seems like it's public record or yeah I, that was yeah. that was that was that was just a aside and i'm sure that there's a lot of people evidently a lot of people who worked with kevin spacey during his time uh on the boards in the uk who have spacey stories to tell but be that as it may with neil and i is truly an enjoyable film i really liked going back to it and it's on filmstruck so if you have Filmstruck, you can watch it. If you it, don't, you can get it and watch it's it. It's on Filmstruck. It's two in a row that we've hit that. Uh, our, our one is a well-loved classics in a certain part of the world that I hope travels. And uh, a recent one that we watched, uh, Matrice, is... Matrice. It's Matrice? A, I think it's French. Yeah, it's rather unknown. So two scores for Filmstruck in a row of really great movies that are up there and may, possibly not any anywhere else so if you don't have a subscription get one or find someone who does um, and I'm also and, 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 and also go to colespeedy.com where you can see all of the archives for La Grande Bouffe The Big Feast and you can also help support us by pledging your support your monthly support on Patreon yeah like we said um, we really want people to take up on some of those rewards for the higher level ones we'd love to have some guests on the show or just recommendations of movies that would be fantastic and that would be fun you can even drink the same beer we're drinking love to go down a brit hole i think i think that's what we need mike they fall I'm cutting you off a brit hole i think you've had too much to drink love to fall down a brit hole with some of our uh, some of our You're guests drunk. across the pond That'd you're drunk wonderful. cake and fine wine cake we're here for the cake and fine wine Thank you all so much for listening. Please remember to turn your cell phones off when you're walking, driving, or riding a bicycle. 